Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'd like to present part three of my series on the selected gross pathology of the reproductive tract, in which we're going to cover the ovary and the oviduct. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me images either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start lecture three with a display. I started lecture one when we talked about the male reproductive tract with a colorful display by male non-human primates. This is the female side of the house, most often seen in old world monkeys and macaques. This is known as sex skin or sexual swelling. And it's seen in female old world primates at the height of their sexual maturity. It tends not to be there in young animals, develops through sexual maturity, and older animals tend to have lesser amounts. It's a great signal. Um, this, some of these animals will have large swellings in the perineal area. This one has a lot of this sex skin over the hind legs, the hips, and the tail. You can tell this is an old world uh, macaque or baboon or rhesus monkey because of the ischial callosities, which um, are uh, only seen in the old world monkeys. And uh, male primates are attracted by this. They tend to be attracted to the females with the largest area of sex skin, the largest swelling, and uh, it's just a thing that you see in old world primates. Okay, well let's look at the ovary. and and. Across animal species, across the different parts of the cycle, there is such a variation in the normal appearance of the ovary. I'm just going to put a couple out there. Um, this is a fairly typical dog ovary. We've all seen them when we've done space. You don't see a lot of them because they're often covered by the fimbria of the oviduct. This one has been peeled back and you can see a number of developing follicles. Even an old corpus luteum, this animal's probably in uh, the end of the luteal phase of its cycle. Uh, animals that are not cycling, probably they would be much smaller. You wouldn't see these uh, lumps and bumps on them a much smaller, harder, more fibrous piece of tissue. If you really want to see good follicles, you really want to see uh, a great ovary, then you want to look at a pig ovary. Because pigs tend to turn things inside out. When you look at their uh, lymph nodes, the medulla is on the outside. The thymus, the medulla is on the outside. And they do the same with their ovaries as well. So you can really see, once you take the uh, the infundibulum, we peel the infundibulum, which is part of the oviduct, which catches all of these uh, uh, rupturing follicles and eggs. Um, once you take that off, you can get a really good look at all the developing follicles. Remember that the animals are born with all of the germ cells that they need um, to develop all the follicles for a lifetime. You don't get any more after you're born. They don't continually develop. So once they're done, they're done. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, infundibulum or the oviduct, those fimbria, the oviduct is actually the, even though the uterus is very long, and when we get into chickens at the end of this lecture, you'll see all the things that goes on. Most fertilization, almost all fertilization occurs in the area of the oviduct. Another uh, uh, interesting ovary is the horse ovary. We have a large uh, uh, ruptured follicle here. It's partially luteinized, it looks like. And the thing about the horse ovary, it's a very hard uh, ovary with a single area, uh, which is called the ovulation fossa, which all of the eggs, and they do produce multiple eggs, only one or two ever come through in any cycle. Um, but uh, uh, they have to pass through this particular notch. The rest of the ovary um, is composed of a lot of uh, smooth muscle, some fibrous connective tissue, and one of the most common uh, misdiagnoses I see with the residents, the first time they get a chance to look at the, an equine ovary, is they get a section through here, section through here, and they call it a lyomyoma because it looks like all smooth muscles, but that is the non-ovulatory path of the ovary. So if you're looking at an uh, equine ovary and you're thinking it's a smooth muscle tumor, chances are you need to back up. 
because you've misread the anatomy of the equine ovary. And then I guess the best ovary of all, the one that we are, are most enthusiastic about is the ovary of the chicken, which here is making the yolks of the eggs. And each of these yolks, very interesting, has a very clear place. Um, here, you can't see it very well here. This is called the stigma. Um, and the stigma is a place where it's a very thin membrane where the uh, this uh, ovary will rupture. Um, it then it will proceed into the oviduct, go on down through the rest of the oviduct. The oviduct is very long. There is no uterus in a bird, and the oviduct goes through a number of uh, uh, very specific functions, which we'll look at to make an egg for our breakfast table. So those are some normal ovaries, and you can see all sorts of crazy ovaries. Um, in Noah's archive from, from lizards and from, from all sorts of animals. Um, but let's move on to the pathology of the ovary. Hemorrhage within the ovary is not uncommon. Um, corpus hemorrhagica is, uh, is fairly common when the bleeding is restricted to the uh, place in the ovary where the recent follicle has ruptured. You can see ovary in uh, dogs. You can see ovary in, uh, in bovine, especially calves. It tends to persist a little more than it does in the cow. And you can often see it in the horse. Um, horses tend to uh, have a lot more hemorrhage than, than other species. At the end of the cycle, some of the follicles, which never did produce an egg, will become anovulatory follicles and can um, be an area of the ovary where there is a lot of hemorrhage. During the normal process of ovulation, in very rare cases, horses can hemorrhage so much into the ovulatory follicle that they can even bleed out. These are known as ovarian hematomas, and when they get really big, they can also have a very destructive effect on the remaining ovary, rendering it non-functional. So horses hemorrhage into functional follicles. At the end of the season, they can hemorrhage into anovulatory follicles. And they're fairly unique in the amount of hemorrhage that occurs within their ovaries. Another time, don't see it too much anymore, but another time that you can see extensive hemorrhage is in the cow. And uh, one of the things that used to be done for animals to quickly bring them back into season so they could be rebred was to manually uh, enucleate or put your thumb through the wall of a uh, corpus luteum. Um, this generally resulted in hemorrhage, destruction of the corpus luteum, and some papers back in the day said that they could achieve up to an 80 to 85 percent return to cycling by doing this practice. The downside of this practice is you have extensive hemorrhage. It can go out into the ovarian bursa, into the surrounding tissue, and can rarely be fatal. Corpora lutea are a normal process following ovulation and is a temporary endocrine change which allows the ovary to produce relatively high levels of progesterone as well as some estrogen, maybe some inhibin, prepare the uterus for implantation. They often will have a somewhat hemorrhagic or cystic area in the middle, which is a normal finding. And not to be confused with the cystic corpus lutea, which may see, be seen in cattle. Luteinized cysts or cystic corpora lutea in cattle occur in the absence of ovulation. 
and due to the long-standing nature, there's usually one and they're surrounded by fibrous connective tissue and often bulge from the surface. Over time and with age, the ovaries will degenerate as we know in all species. Uh, in the dog, in older ovaries, you may see clusters of anovulatory follicles, some of which are partially luteinized. Degeneration of ovaries may be the result of, or, uh, well, maybe the result of uh, formation of cysts. Guinea pigs are a great example in which uh, the, the radiovarii, an epithelial line structure, which is in the middle of the ovary, begins to accumulate fluid. And the progressive accumulation of fluid, the formation of the cystic radiovarii, ultimately results in destruction of functional ovary within 12 to 15 months in most guinea pigs. This can happen in dogs as well. In this great picture from uh, Rob Foster, the uh, the radiovarii is actually formed by the mesonephric tubules, and it's very difficult, grossly, to tell whether this is a, a cystic follicular disease um, or a cystic radiovarii. Um, and sometimes you will see that these cysts are surrounded by smooth muscle. Because the radiovarii is formed by mesonephric tubules, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, if they're surrounded by smooth muscle, Dr. Foster, uh, in the most recent JKP, does recommend calling them cystic mesonephric tubules. Leaving degenerative changes, when we look at inflammatory changes of, uh, of the ovary and the oviduct, there really aren't a whole lot um, to talk about. Certainly, bacterial infections of the ovary and of the surrounding oviduct can be seen in a number of species. Laboratory animal species, mycoplasma commonly uh, results in inflammation of the, uh, of the uterus and the oviduct. Uh, something similar is seen in rabbits with bordetella, in, excuse me, rabbits with pasturella and guinea pigs with bordetella. Granulomatous uh, oophoritis is uncommon, uh, but you can see it in association with infection with host adapted salmonella. There's a case of salmonella pylorum uh, in causing granulomatous oophoritis in a chicken. One of the more common things that we see in ovaries is neoplasia. Uh, not as common as we see in the testes of the male dog, but ovarian neoplasia, especially in poultry, which we'll look at in a minute, is very common. One of the classic diseases, and, and I think I'm limited in discussing uh, uh, diseases of the ovary because so many look alike. It's not, this is a, a, a tissue that microscopic examination is often required to differentiate between a number of diseases, but I think one of the classic diseases of horses, which has a characteristic appearance in the ovary, is the granulosa cell tumor. This hemorrhagic enlarged cystic ovary is very classic for granulosa cell tumor in the horse. Um, these are classified with the sex cord stromal tumors. Um, they usually produce testosterone, although they can also produce uh, progesterone or estrogen, the animals will often uh, manifest with signs associated with that produ production, with that abnormal production of uh, sex hormones and may uh, exhibit clinical signs of nymphomania acting like a, a stallion, something like that. Their cycle may be off. They may be in, in what appears to be continuous estrus or total anestrus. And often the contralateral ovary is atrophied due to inhibin production by the tumor. The inhibin suppresses follicle stimulation hormone. And so you have a lack of development in the contralateral uh, ovary.
Uh, you can see them in dogs as well, but there's nothing really special about this or characteristic like we see in the horses. And just for fun, granulosa cell tumors are one of the most common neoplasms in gerbils. Probably the most common would be adrenocortical tumors. If we look at this cross section of an ovary, this is a cystadenoma, but we're still hard pressed to differentiate this from, from maybe degenerative and cystic disease of the ovary, which can be seen in older dogs. Epithelial tumors, which can be uh, either benign or malignant in the dog, generally arise from the surface epithelium of the ovary. Epithelial tumors are a, a big problem in humans, not so much in animal species, and are largely restricted to the dog. In cases of malignant tumors, um, the literature is very widely separated on the uh, potential for metastasis. Uh, ovarian epithelial neoplasms tend to be benign, and they can also be confused with uh, uh, small aggregates of subsurface epithelium. But the true tumors, about 10% appear to be malignant, and a lot of them do not have any metastatic, any documented metastatic behavior. They're often seen, these tumors are often seen on routine spays or surgeries for other abnormalities. When seen in cats, uh, ovarian carcinoma is one of those neoplasms that likes to explant um, and will result in carcinomatosis. There's a great picture from a big cat. This is a jaguar um, with a, a papillary carcinoma of the ovary from Dr. Jill Bryan. Here's a neoplasm that you sh still can or you should be able to uh, diagnose uh, grossly because you shouldn't have hair in any tumor. And uh, uh, ovarian teratomas or testicular teratomas, they tend to, these particular tumors tend to pop up in the gonads and they're thought to be parthenogenic. They develop from a, a single germ cell that's completed its first meiotic division, but not its second. And then it goes on to start to form essentially another animal. And you will see, uh, you will see cells from at least two of three of the major cell types, ectodermal, mesodermal or endodermal. So this might have uh, well-formed skin and hair follicles and hair from the ectoderm. Okay, you may have bone and cartilage from the mesoderm. You may have the, about the only thing that's endodermal if you're keeping score is uh, the lining of the respiratory and GI tracts. Pretty much all the other epithelial tissues that you'll see in here are going to be, including neuroectoderm, are going to be ectodermal. Uh, you can rarely find teratomas in other uh, organs, but they're mostly always gonadal. Uh, ferrets like to put them in their adrenal glands for some reason. Here's another tumor that you really can't tell from anything else, but if I tell you that this is a maned wolf, um, they specifically will develop a germ cell tumor known as a dysgerminoma. Let's remember that all of the male testicular neoplasms have a equivalent in the female. When we talk about interstitial cell tumors in the male, we think about the steroid producing sex cord tumors in the female. Well, when we think about seminomas, which are common in males, the female equivalent is the dysgerminoma, generally large round cells in sheets, which look very much like a seminoma, not a common neoplasm in animal species, probably most commonly seen in dogs and of course these main wolves. Looking at fixed tissue from a horse, 
and here is the ovary here and then we have all of this cystic tissue here is the fimbria or the oviduct and there are large uh, numbers of cystic epiophoron most of the and that's a fancy term I don't use very much um, when we look at cysts in and around the ovary the vast majority of cysts are peri ovarian they may arise from uh, the remnants of the paramesonephric duct or the mesonephric duct we did look at the cystic ovarii, which is the only one that really uh, shows up within the ovary and can do damage to the ovary. Most of the cysts that you see are going to be paraovarial. They may be fimbrial, arising from the paramesonephric duct. Here is a guinea pig. Okay, this one happens to be a large paraovarian cyst. So, true ovarian cysts. Uh, somewhat uncommon can be either follicular or radiovarii but the majority of what we see the really good big ones are going to be para ovarian okay and when we look at birds especially poultry and we see this large neoplasm and smaller explants throughout the abdomen very likely going to be ovarian carcinoma or perhaps a oviductal carcinoma and that's one that you sort of have to go uh, to the microscope to figure out which one and, and it still can be very confusing but ovarian carcinomas are extremely common in uh, in production birds well now we are on to the oviduct of the chicken we've already looked at the ovary before and here's a really nice picture of the ovary showing those uh, uh, stigma right there which is where this uh, follicle is going to split and then let's look at this long oviduct okay the ovary is here and when that follicle ruptures it's going to release the ovum also known as the yolk of the egg into the infundibulum. The infundibulum is only about three to four inches long and it's going to grab onto that ovum and this is the place where fertilization is going to take place if it takes place. Right down here is something called the sperm host glands. Okay. If the animal has sperm, that sperm actually has to travel all the way up here to fertilize the eggs. But the sperm host gland is able to keep sperm viable within the hen's body for up to two weeks. Okay, so now we have a, a yolk which is starting to pass down, whether it's fertilized or not. Here it comes. And the next section of the oviduct is the magnum. It's the largest portion of the oviduct and that is where the albumin covering to the uh, yolk forms it takes about three hours for passage of the yolk and the attachment of the albumin before it arises in the isthmus the isthmus is where the inner and outer shell membranes will form over a period of about an hour to an hour and a half. So the inner and outer shell membranes are now surrounding the white of the egg, the yolk of the egg, and then it will pass on into what is obviously and, and well named the shell gland. Now this is where the, uh, the egg remains for the longest period of time. The uh, hen is going to mobilize uh, 8 to 10 percent of its body calcium to form the eggshell and that's about a gram so this is why you have to make sure that uh, the chickens that layers are getting a a very good source of calcium or else they're going to take they're not going to be able to replace the calcium in their bones they're going to get very brittle bones they will break they will develop a a form of paralysis known as uh, brooder paralysis 
as a result of hyper hypocalcemia. So in about uh, uh, 20 hours, the fully formed egg will enter the vagina, which really doesn't, uh, doesn't do much. But one thing that the muscular contractions will do is it will turn around. Normally the egg is formed and passes into the vagina with the small end first, but it flips around and then it is going to go out through the vent with the wide end first. Don't ask me why it happens that way, but just accept that it does. Wide end first. Okay, well that happens on the left side. Remember that, uh, that poultry, generally most birds, have one functional ovary and oviduct and testis, and that's on the left side. The right is vestigial, and occasionally uh, you will see changes in vestigial uh, oviducts, and they're known as cystic right oviducts. You'll see fluid accumulation could be just a little bit, um, or it could be a lot like this, and they have this large abdominal cyst. They don't generally cause any problem, affect, affect egg laying or whatever, but uh, you can see that. Here's another great picture of one by Guillermo Rimoldi um, showing the size that these oviducts can accumulate. Uh, tumors can arise in, in right ovaries, uh, Merix uh, disease, uh, seminomas in a, a wide range of, uh, of pet birds can affect not only the functional left ovary, but also can cause neoplastic transformation in the right ovary as well. Sounds like a, a, a complex problem, and uh, a number of things can happen, including the formation of rather large eggs that, for one reason or another, cannot pass out of the bird, could have a cloacal papilloma, or simply be a young bird which have trouble, and young birds uh, are overrepresented in, uh, in the form of egg-bound uh, animals. Inflammatory diseases of the, uh, of the oviduct, very similar to that which we see in the ovary. Uh, cholibacillosis or cholecystemia is one that will common and probably the most common cause of salpingitis in laying hens. We looked at salmonella or host adapted uh, 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 salmonella pylorum, um, which can cause disease as well. Of course, this is all going to contribute to the problems associated with laying. And when we get this type of problem, you can see rupture of the uh, oviduct, the inflamed oviduct, and then spillage of the contents of the egg into the abdominal cavity, which is known as uh, egg yolk peritonitis, a fairly common cause of sporadic death in layer hens. And often you can culture a variety of bacteria, including uh, uh, E. coli, Salmonella, and Pasteurella out of these animals. Another case of caseous salpingitis, or inflammation, a bacterial infection of the oviduct due to E. coli. And you can see that uh, um, here are some uh, oviducts that have been blocked by eggs and have had sort of this recurring uh, infection and scarring and fibrosis, another really nice case. Um, this one uh, is a uh, the oviduct of a chicken. You can also see it in uh, other poultry, such as ducks with rimarella, sort of a kissing cousin to pasturella. Internal overposition or internal layers is often idiopathic and may be temporary, may not affect the long-term productivity of the hen, but remember that uh, you can have reverse peristalsis of the oviduct, and it actually comes back out through the fimbria, which is sort of an unusual thing. Um, 
There is also a condition known as erratic ovulation and defective egg syndrome, which is seen as a multifactorial condition, which may result from overstimulation of young growing pullets with too much light and uh, possibly uh, improper overweight animals, and you get a, a wide variety of changes in the eggs, including double yolks, internal overposition, uh, and a number of other things. So that is uh, erratic ovulation defective egg syndrome. And then we will just finish up with another chicken here with little tumorlets all over the abdomen just to remember that uh, those neoplasms may arise either from the oviduct or from the ovary, a very common neoplasm in commercial poultry. Okay, well that's a quick uh, coverage of the ovary of the uh, a wide range of domestic species and the overduct. Uh, we are going to go on to our next lecture with uh, a organ I think I understand a little bit more than the ovary and the overduct and that's the uterus and I look forward to, uh, to lecture number four in this series. I hope that you found uh, uh, this interesting, learned maybe a thing or two and uh, I want to always thank the people that helped me learn reproductive pathology. Dr. Rob Foster from the University of Guelph, absolutely fantastic uh, guy and has always been extremely helpful to me. Uh, and Dr. Don Schlafer from the University of Cornell and I have to, uh, have to also mention Dr. Linda Munson. She's no longer with us now, but uh, um, she was extremely uh, uh, helpful to me as a resident and uh, her enthusiasm for reproductive pathology was was absolutely contagious and we, we miss her so much okay well we'll see you uh, again hopefully on the uh, uh, foundations youtube or facebook channel and look for uh, lectures on a lot of other systems beyond the reproductive tract hey thanks so much for hanging in there with me and we'll see you tomorrow